it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I was hunted by a pack of werewolves for sport by Caleb Slieger. Red and the Wolves, part one. I searched the crowd coming onto the train like a predator watches a flock of sheep milling about in the field. I watched for who was aware and who wasn't, who was looking around and who had their head down. I was looking for what separated the wolves from the sheep, or in this case, the sheepdog amongst the sheep. I saw him bundle in with a herd of people onto the packed subway car, his head up and scanning, choosing to stand rather than sit, his back to the corner. He was prior military or law enforcement. I could tell by the way he stood and the look in his eyes. He also had an aura of violence about him. Being in my line of work, it does you good to smell the violence on a man before you get close. He spotted me as I spotted him, because we were both doing the same thing. People watching, albeit I was doing it for different reasons. I gave him a smile, just flirtatious enough with a hint of sadness. I knew how to attract men. It was my job anyway. I knew how to be just mysterious enough to bait the hook for a man like him. Men like him love a damsel in distress. Now I would sit and let him stew with the idea of me on his mind. We had three stops until I needed to get off, and I needed to know if he was in for the long haul. My phone vibrated in my pocket. I looked to see it was a text from a block number. It said, At 2200... The quarry has entered the designated hunting grounds. The game is afoot. Eleven hours, fifty-nine minutes remaining. I frowned when I saw I was lumped into a group chat with four other numbers. One said, Enjoy your last train ride, bitch. I already knew who it was before I even read the signature. Mikia. So that meant the other three numbers were his packmates. The packmaster, Alexei was one of the numbers. They were already in the area. I had to move fast. I pulled the red scarf tighter around my neck. I lowered my head to smell the scent of my sister's perfume. I needed a reminder for why I was doing this. Of course, I couldn't take off the scarf. I was instructed to wear it for the whole time of the trial, or I'd automatically forfeit and lose. It was the same perfume my sister always wore that they were using to hunt me down. After two more stops, the train was almost empty. It was literally just me, the man, and an older couple at the other end of the car. I had to do this now. I walked up to him. He was already watching me in the reflection of the window while he pretended to be looking down at his phone. When I got a couple of steps away, he looked up and gave me a plight questioning stare. I don't usually do this, but... I ran my hand through my hair nervously, putting a little tremble in my voice for good measure. I leaned in close to break out the doe eyes. You wouldn't happen to be a cop, would you? Or do you know any cops? His eyes widened and he looked me over. I had everything where he could see it and put two and two together. He looked at the large purple bruise on my wrist as I played nervously with my hair. I was leaned in enough for him to see the makeup hiding my black eye, and the top button of my blouse was undone so I could keep his attention. He put the clues together, or at least the clues I wanted him to. He asked in a low voice, Are you in any danger, ma'am? Jackpot. I knew it. He was a cop or former cop. He jumped right into action, took the bait nicely. I pulled the scarf up in an attempt to cover my face and looked around the car nervously. Can you talk with me over here? I said, nodding in the direction of the cramped area between the cars. He nodded back in agreement, and we crept into the small, dark compartment. Once the door was firmly shut behind us, 
and let the silence hang in the air for good effect. We both stood close to each other and swayed lightly back and forth with the motion of the speeding train. Light strobed softly through the windows, and I could hear his breathing. I wondered if he was close enough to smell my sister's perfume. He waited patiently for me to continue. I'm in trouble, I said softly. I don't know who to go to for help. I can't go directly to the cops, but I need someone like them to keep me safe. Just tell me what happened, miss, the man said in a gentle voice. It was a practice patience of a man who does this for a living. I'm in trouble, I said. I'm on the run from some men I used to work for, but there is a place in the city where I can go to be safe, to be free. The man nodded slowly in understanding. I saw his hand subconsciously touch the left side of his jacket. He probably had a gun in there and was feeling it for comfort. I have to get there within the next couple of hours. If I don't hurry, they'll kill me. Please. I opened the latch on my purse to show him stacks of money held together with rubber bands. I can pay you. I have 30,000. His eyes widened at this, and he finally spoke. First off, answer my questions truthfully. This man, is he your pimp? And this money, did you steal it from him? Yes, I said. He is my pimp. He and his crew forced me at a young age to work for them. And no, this is money I've saved up over the years to escape. Well, he'll say it's his money, but it's my body that earned it. A little anger entered my voice at this. Well, it seemed to impress the man. I was glad I didn't have to completely lie to him about everything. Where do you have to go? He asked. Not far. I have to meet up with a contact to tell me the location of the safe house. The contact's at the next stop. How many men does your boss have? He counted quickly. Four, including him, I answered. He considered this for a while. I could see him weighing the situation in his mind. Finally, he answered. Four isn't bad. I'll escort you to your contact for half the money. And if I want to bail after that, I bail. If it's not completely fucked, I'll take you all the way. I couldn't help but smile. He was confident and pragmatic, and that was a good sign. But he believed Mikhail and the pack were only humans, and he was sorely wrong. Deal, I say. Are you a cop? He gave a half smile. I'm a military police officer, just back home for a couple of days for my father's funeral. It was yesterday. I'm shipping back out in a couple of days. Boy, could I pick him. Military training and a cop. We were coming up on the stop now. I needed him to be a little more wary of the job he'd agreed to. Him being too confident would get us both killed. The pack would be on our trail soon. The doors opened up onto the platform. I told my new hired man we needed to find Dimitri Circle. He walked up to a giant map plastered on the subway wall. Anyone else would have used a phone, but he said he didn't need his phone. I was now starting to doubt my decision with the boomer traits he was showing. I saw a group of men walking towards us while he was distracted with the map. He did throw a glance at them and must have seen them as a non-threat. They were just punky teens acting tough, but I had put him on his toes. There were three of them, the tallest one leading his friend. He was one of those obnoxious people who talk with their hands. As he came close to me, he was waving his hands around, describing some dumb thing he and his friends had done last night. I looped the handle of the purse around his arm and screamed as I grabbed onto him. Let go, asshole! I screamed at him. My hand slipped to my stun gun in my coat pocket, and I gave him a jolt to the stomach. He gurgled and dropped to the ground like his clothes weighed a thousand pounds. The other two reacted in anger, as expected. Chica bliat, and you whore, came from their lips. Well, they weren't wrong. My bodyguard spun around and intercepted the two as they gave chase to me. He collided hard with one of them. A knee to the groin at full charge was enough to drop the punk into a whimpering mess. The last one turned to swing on the bodyguard. 
the bodyguard stepped under the punch to execute a perfectly timed counterattack. The right hook knocked the kid smooth out. I stood in amazement. I had originally planned to use my higher guard as a sacrifice to slow down Mikhail in the pack, but maybe we had a chance. Maybe we would both make it. But there I was being stupid again. Well, I thought I'd killed foolish thoughts like naive hope a long time ago. The tall man I'd tased was beginning to sit up. I saw the flash of a silver handgun being pulled out from the back of his pants. Oh, God, this wannabe gangster actually had a gun. Well, this was getting out of hand. I didn't want the idiot to get shot. But the bodyguard pulled out his own gun much faster and pointed it down at the thug. Don't do it, punk, the bodyguard yelled. I saw the thug hesitate, gun still pointed downwards by his side. But I could see the look of defiance on his young face, and I could see the cold gaze of violence in my bodyguards. It was a pissing contest that would end in death. I reached back into my deep coat pockets and pulled out my pepper spray. Yep, I had more utilities than Batman. I aimed high and let loose with an arc of the burning liquid. The stream hit the thug square in the face, and he scrunched his face in pain. Leave him, I said as I reached over to pull my bodyguard's arm down. He stared, surprised at the now squirming and screaming thug on the ground. We hurried to the long set of stairs leading up out of the subway. In our long climb up, I heard my phone vibrate again. I looked down at it in my hand. I smell a man with her. The trace of gunpowder and gun oil on him. Cop, maybe. Oh, she has pepper spray and she's heading south. It was from a number I didn't recognize in the same group chat, but I knew it was another pack member. As we crested the stairs into the snowy night streets, I turned to look back down into the subway at the bottom of the stairs. There he was, walking up with his hands in his pockets. When he tilted his head up to follow us, the fluorescent lights in the subway reflected off them to make them flash green and gold. The corner of his lip curled up in a snarl. I didn't know him personally, but I recognized him from the brothel and knew his name. He was short with a stocky frame, corded muscles bulging in his neck. His black hair slicked back, matching his nicely cut goatee. He moved with an eerie, weightless grace as he began stalking his way up the stairs. He removed his hands from his pockets, and I could see the claws beginning to form. You smell pepper spray, Ivan. It's bear mace, I yelled at him loudly. My bodyguard turned to see the approaching man. I let loose with a continued stream of mace, my arm working in a circular motion, dowsing the steps with a face-burning liquid. Ivan was a good twenty feet out of the range of the arcing stream of mace, but he was also downwind. He let out an audible growl before he sneezed and started shaking his head, his eyes and nose already leaking like faucets, mucus slinging everywhere. Damn, talk about a bad reaction, the bodyguard said. We were both at the top now, staring. Ivan was in the throes of pain. Between the blur of his furious head shaking, I could see his transformation coming further along. His goatee was now a beard. The texture of his hair took on a dark fur-like quality. His arms had gotten longer, and the bones at the end of his fingers were jutting out of the skin into sharpened points. I could see his own blood dripping from his hands the white tips of the bone claws stabbing through his skin. My bodyguard was frozen in amazement at the horrid sight before him. I believe this was the moment he regretted taking this job. I had to grab him by the arm to pull him away. Dimitri Circle should be around here, I told him as we ran down the snow-covered street. My informant will be in room 432 at the Fountainwood Apartments. It was the bodyguard that spotted the apartment shortly after. It was a run-down square brick building, rising high into the sky. It was dotted with many windows, most broken. The locked security door was also broken, and we just let ourselves into the complex. Inside, the volume was tumultuous with loud tenants and thin walls, trash left to stink up the hallways, leaking ceilings and broken hallway lights. I'd lived in places like this before. 
On the fourth floor, at the end of a long, dark hallway, we found 432. The bodyguard checked the stairwell entrance at the other end of the hall to find it chained shut. If the pack found us, they could only come in from one direction. Do you need me to come inside with you? he asked as I began knocking on the door. Already we could smell the strong scent of marijuana emitting through the door. No, I'll be fine. Be look at while I deal with whoever's inside, I reassured him. The door opened a crack, and I almost caught a second-hand high from the smell wafting out of the apartment. I saw a pretty female face peeking at me with a deadpan expression. Oh, it's you, came a droning voice from behind the door. I'm surprised you even made it. Well, we sitting ducks out here, lady, I told her in frustration. Oh, yeah, replied the bored voice. But only you can come in. Your friend has a cop face. I have rules against showing any kindness to cops, she droned on, her eye flicking to my bodyguard. Sure thing, lady, my bodyguard said over his shoulder, looking agitated. Rules are rules. The door closed, and I heard the chain bolt sliding free. It opened again just enough for me to slip inside. It was like I'd walked into a hippie's dreamland. The room was decorated with black lights, glowing posters, and illicit vegetation, planted under heat lamps in the living room and kitchen. I scanned the small apartment. Only the girl and a stoner do to sleep on the couch. The sleeping stoner must have been a guard because there was a sawed-off shotgun wedged underneath the sofa for him to reach for. I guess I wasn't considered enough of a threat to wake him up. You have three choices for a safe house, the woman explained. You had a choice of three different stops on the train, which each led to their own specific informant. Each informant has the location to three different safe houses. And they should keep the hunters from knowing where you're going and cheating by just killing you when they get close to the safe house. That's like... The woman looked up and counted in her head. Nine different safe houses you could have picked. They know I'm here, so that narrows it back down to three safe houses I can possibly pick, I said impatiently. The stoner girl looked like she didn't understand. She flopped open a paper map to show me. There was a red circle around Fountain Woods, where we were, and three more dark circles around three locations spread out on the map. The circles on all of these said, Grandma's house. I'm so glad she thought this was funny. I looked at all three locations and decided on the closest one at a construction site. <laughs> Why be fancy? Just make a mad rush straight up the middle. I made a mental note, nodded to her, and turned back to the door. I felt the woman staring at me like she was waiting for something. Um, I'm ready to go, so like, bye. I said to her, Oh no, you gotta tell me which location you picked, she blurted. <laughs> Screw you, no I don't, I said back. I didn't trust this idiot not to sell me out to the first wolf who came knocking. Yes, you do. I have to call and set it up, she said as she pulled out her phone. If they don't get my call, they won't be there. I stared at her for a while, pissed. Whatever, Put it on speakerphone so I can hear who it is, I demanded. Fine, said the woman, hitting speed dial on the phone. Where are you going? I waited until the phone was answered and an unfamiliar man's voice spoke up. The idiot lady looked at me to tell her where I was going. The construction side of Wicker Street, I answered. Extraction team will be en route. You have 11 hours left to get there. Good luck. The voice finished and hung up. I didn't like it, but I had no choice. I still expected whoever was on the phone to send an immediate message to the hunting pack. But maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a security protocol to keep the pack from paying off the teams at the safe houses to tell them where I was going. Hopefully they were as confused as I was. To keep the hunt fair. You can leave now, Red, the woman said. At first I didn't catch the reference because I was a brunette, tired and in a hurry. But it hit me a second later. She thought this was funny. Maybe even amused her to know I could be in the last hours of my life. I gave her a cold stare. 
and that's when I noticed a small tattoo on her neck. I didn't have to lean in too close to already know what it was. It was the burning moon. It was a brand of ownership. It was Mikhail's brand. A tattoo he only gave to his personal favourites. She must have been a prostitute at some point like me. Well, she was prettier than most. He gave her this sweet little spot dealing for him. She was kept in an apartment all for himself. Hey, um, how about I sweeten the pot a little? I said with a disarming smile. I popped open my handbag and her greedy eyes saw the cash within. How about I tip you for your services? You know, just to keep things between us girls. I'm thinking 1,000 for a secret like this. She said she stepped in closer to glare down at the money, my hand rummaging around inside. Of course, us ladies need to work together to stay ahead of the wolves, I said cheerfully. They feed upon us and victimize us like sheep, I continued as I finally found what I needed. But you know, I paused for dramatic effect. She looked up from the money and into my eyes. Sometimes, we're the most dangerous wolf of all. My hand shot out of my purse and jammed a long metal fingernail filer into her neck. My other hand covered her mouth, and I forced it to the wall. Her eyes bulged as I muffled her scream. She bled out within seconds as I lowered her to the floor, blood pouring down one side of her like a leaky faucet. She wouldn't be running back to tell her master like a good pet now. I wiped off her blood on her clothes and slipped back out into the hallway. The stoner asleep on the couch, still happily dreaming. Back in the hallway, my bodyguard didn't even turn to acknowledge me. He was focused on something at the far end of the hall. I quickly saw what it was. Ivan had found us, and he looked pissed. Ivan no longer looked human. The only reason we knew it was him was because this monster wore the same tattered clothes as Ivan. Now he was completely in his best form. His snout and face covered with fur, shining golden eyes, muscles ripping through his clothes, bone claws long and curved. What sort of gun are you packing? I asked with fear in my voice. It's, uh, Sean, by the way, he answered. Sean of Charka. I thought you should know the name of the guy you're getting killed. Well, as for my gun, it's nowhere near big enough. Talking was over as Sean leveled his pistol as the wolf began charging us. I flattened myself against the apartment's door as Sean let out two quick shots. Ivan staggered as part of his head combusted into red mist. But he didn't drop him. He skidded off the hallway wall and continued running towards us, leaving a blood trail in his wake. The wolf was close now. He hooked his claws into the thin walls and began pulling himself up to run alongside of it. Sean panicked and fired two more shots. The first one missed, the second a shoulder graze. When Ivan's forward momentum got him to the ceiling, he kicked off with all four limbs to shoot like an upside-down missile straight towards Sean. I opened the door to fall back into the apartment at the last instant. I saw Sean duck as the beast soared over him. Sean screamed out in pain. More gunshots went off in the hallway, mixed with screams and growls. I kicked the doorway back closed. I flipped around on my stomach to stare at the count. I had to get that shotgun. I scrambled past the dead woman's body to snatch it up. As I stood up, the stoner was finally awake and grabbed at me in panic. I hit him in the nose with the butt of the shotgun to put him back into his slumber. As I returned my attention to the door, Sean and the wolf came bursting through. Sean crashed to the ground with the wolf on top of him, taking a huge bite out of Sean's left arm. He was covered with blood, and I noticed Ivan's legs and right arm were human again. I figured Ivan was dying from the gunshots to the head, but wasn't going to die soon enough for Sean to survive. As the wolf shook Sean back and forth like a ragdoll, 
I steadily approached them and put the two barrels of the shoddy inches away from Ivan's exposed brain. With a thunderous boom, the wolf's head exploded all across the side wall. Sean frantically kicked the headless body off and scrambled away, part of the wolf snout still attached to his arm, now quickly transforming back into human teeth. I dropped to my knees and let out a sigh of relief. Sean backed up against the wall and just stared at the gory mess. Oh, I quit, lady, he finally said. No, I replied. You have to finish this now. You killed an honored pack member. The only way you stay alive is if you leave with me. But you killed him, he replied. Semantics, I scoffed. We both killed him. Besides, I'll just lie and said you did the whole thing. So, um, we're in this together. Oh, you are a bitch, he replied flatly. Yeah, I know, I replied back. Part 2 Ivan was dead. His brain splattered all over the apartment walls. This was a death sentence for the both of us. Sean had to duct tape up his bleeding arms with the tape from the apartment's kitchen. It stopped the bleeding, but wouldn't be enough. I hurried Sean down the hallway. We had to get out of this apartment before the rest of the pack smelled the blood. Stop it. Stop this right now. Sean yelled at me as he pulled me to the side. We stood in the building's dingy stairwell. You tell me what I'm really up against. You tell me what's trying to kill both of us. Sean yelled at me, his voice echoing down the stairwell. His eyes were a fury and his jaw was clenched. I almost felt sorry for what I'd done to him. They... They're werewolves, I said with trepidation. Yeah, no shit... I figured that little piece out, he told me, eyes bulging. Why are they trying to kill you? Why are they trying to kill us? He demanded. It's a trial. It's a game. A rite of passage for young wolves to join the pack, I answered back. They hunt an innocent virgin over one night. The youngest wolf leads the pack, and he must make the kill to be fully initiated. And Sean did what I knew would come next. He looked me over and made a pfft sound. You're no virgin, missy, he said rudely. I'm taking my sister's place, I shouted back. I'm taking her place so she doesn't get killed. Yeah, but we do. We get to be sacrificed for your pure virginal sister, Sean sneered. No, I counted. We get to the safe house and we end the game. Mikhail loses and he's ejected from the pack. Mikhail, Sean asked. Is he the big bad wolf leading these assholes? No, he's the pup, the youngest of the group. Tonight's his ritual, his initiation to the pack. Alexei's the pack master. Alexei's allowing Mikhail to lead the pack for only one night. Mikhail has 12 hours to find and kill me. Sean looked at his watch. How far is the safe house? The wicker construction side of town over, so two hours by car, four by public transportation, and I'm not even considering walking, I said. Sean was silent for a minute. You chose the closest safe house, didn't you? Even though it was the most obvious and the most dangerous, didn't you? Yes, I began to reply. I've known you for an hour, Sean interrupted, and I've guessed your decision. I'm pretty sure Mikhail knows you a little better than me. You're predictable, hot-headed, stubborn. He'll know where you're going, and what path you're taking. He knows you'll take the fastest route. So, um, well, now our only chance for survival is speed. Run the ball right up the middle before they close in on us, he finished. Those were my thoughts exactly. I guess I was predictable. Once again, I grabbed him by the arm and we ran down the stairwell and into the snowy street. The sawed-off shorty halfway hidden, tucked under my arm and light jacket. When we made it out onto the streets, I noticed how empty it was. It was cold, the temperature was dropping, and it was past midnight in the middle of the ghetto. 
Finding a cab would be difficult. Once again, Sean stole the idea from my head. We have to steal a car. We began running along the curb, shopping around the snow-covered cars. A wolf's howl tore through the night air with its eerie tone. It echoed off the buildings, making it hard to pinpoint. Sean and I looked at each other. This was definitely not a sound you should hear in the city. Another howl answered it from further up the street, this one much closer. I checked my phone and I wasn't surprised to find new messages. Ivan is dead. Girl out in the open. Funnel her towards Mikhail so he can take the kill. The man is mine, it said. I figured this was Alexei talking to the other unnamed wolf in the pack. This meant Mikhail wasn't one of the two wolves homing in on us. We still had time. I showed Sean my phone screen and his eyes widened. Come on, he said, this time grabbing me by the arm and pulling me off the streets towards a run-down building. Pulled me up to a door with a thick chain and padlock. He swiped the shotgun away from me and leveled it at the lock. No time to go car shopping. We need to get off the street. Stop, I told him as I pushed the shotgun away from the lock. I can pick the lock. The blast will just bring them faster. And so I began picking the lock with one of the gadgets from my purse. I thought a lot of scenarios about how tonight would play out, and a lot required breaking into lock buildings. I popped the padlock and went to remove it. Sean put his hand over mine. He was now hovering over me, no longer facing the street. Mm, not yet. Don't open it yet, he whispered in my ear. I continued messing with the chain and padlock. I could feel the tension emitting from Sean's posture. I listened and kept my head down as Sean shielded me. I could just barely make out footsteps approaching. Now... He yelled as he spun around and fired off one barrel into the street. I heard the shattering glass, the hiss of air from a tire, and a deep growl. I hurriedly pulled the chain from the door and swung the door open. I looked back to see the shotgun-ridden car across the street. Its windows shattered, and it was leaning to the side from loss of air in a front tire. Snow slid off its hood and roof. A figure bounded over the hood and sprinted towards us. Sean sighted it and fired. The creature jumped to the cover of another vehicle on our side of the street, just a split second before the shotgun blasted its remaining shell. The wolf made it behind the vehicle just in time. The pebblets of the shotgun peppered the new vehicle our attacker was hiding behind. The car began honking and flashing its brights, letting off a shrill alarm. I saw the figure retreat from the high-pitched alarm. The figure was lean and gangly, its face covered with fur and its eyes reflecting from the overhead streetlights. It wore a dark blue tracksuit which already showed damp spots of blood from being hit by the shotgun spread. The wolf skittered into the shadows along the buildings, only its gold eyes reflecting back at us. It was making sure to stay out of the way of the shotgun's deadly range. Sean popped the shotgun open and ejected the shells. He pantomimed placing two new ones in and snapped the shotgun back to ready. We were out of ammo, and this bluff would only work for so long. Stay back, he shouted at the wolf. Not how you speak to another person, but how you do when trying to scare away a wild dog. I'll blow you apart if you follow us. We both backed into the darkened building. It was some sort of abandoned emergency clinic or medical office. I brought the chain with me so we could loop and paddle up the chain from the other side. As I looped the chain... I could hear low growling from the other side as the wolf patiently pursued us, waiting just on the other side. We were left in pitch black and had to navigate the hallways with a flashlight on my phone. Then we busted through a door into a back alleyway. Sean ran across the alley to kick in a door to another business. This was some sort of grocery store and we happened to surprise a large family living in the back rooms. They were very surprised to see a woman and a bloodied man with a shotgun come barreling into their living corridors. It must have been a community of families squatting illegally in the building, because I counted twelve people in total, stuffed into the small room. Five of them were kids. All of them were crammed together with mattresses on the ground, and a thin clothesline running down the centre of the room its only barrier. 
One young man's sight shone up and decided to jump towards a nearby lampstand, grabbing for something. Sean, quick reflexed as ever, intercepted the man and rammed him into the wall. Sean quickly opened the drawer of the lampstand to reveal a small handgun. Sean snatched it up and pointed the empty shotgun at them one-handedly. They were all screaming while Sean screamed back at them to calm down. The chaos went on for a moment until I finally cut in. Line them up against the wall, I commanded Sean. What? No, you're crazy, he asked back in disbelief. Oh my god, Sean, just line them up against the wall. I'm not going to execute them like a war criminal, I fussed back at him. He issued gruff orders and waved his gun at them. They formed a ragged line against the wall, the older ones hiding the children between them. I reached into my purse for my last trick and pulled out a small bottle of perfume. I began running down the line, spraying them like an over-aggressive beauty attendant at the mall. The small room filled up quickly with its strong but beautiful scent. My sister had been forced to wear this perfume ever since we were taken. The wolves had deemed her and a couple of other girls as special and set them apart from the rest of us. The rest of us were forced to make money for the wolves. Prostitution, drug dealing, stealing. That was our school of hard knocks. Oh, for my sister, she and her group of girls were pampered and educated and taught to be obedient. My sister was set in a special subclass, separated from the rest of us. She was kept pampered and untainted for the pleasure of the royal werewolf members. The young wolves can either pick an untainted girl to breed with and continue the bloodline or pick to hunt and slaughter during initiation. Why do the hunted girls have to be pure? I don't know, some chauvinistic ancient ritual, something the Nauri people did back hundreds of years ago. It's always been a rite of passage for wolves becoming four members. Me and my sister, Anika, are twins. Well, I'm the oldest. I was originally selected to have the life of a pampered plaything for the wolves to use. When I realized what my life would be and what awaited Anika, I switched places back with her the first night. She was my little sister. She was too kind and too pure to live the life I was forced into. I had to protect her. It's what a mother would have wanted. The perfume was specifically used on my sister and her group of girls by the strict madame that run the house she stayed at. It was a scent only used for the untainted girls. I was made to wear her scarf so the wolves could track the unique scent of the perfume. The madame kept the perfume locked up in her room. Sometime later in the coming morning, the wolves would find a dead madame with her perfume missing. The perfume I'd stolen was the same perfume I was dousing the poor family with now. Well, hopefully, it would throw the wolves off the scent. Once I covered all of the family sufficiently, I told them to go. Those poor people just stared at me and didn't move, and too terrified. I looked to Sean so he could convince them to leave. He pointed his gun in the air and fired off a shot from the pistol. Go! Run! The family then stormed out of the room, going in every direction. Let's go, Sean said. Your little centric won't matter if they lay eyes on us. We exited out of the front of the building. We seemed to be in the clear. We heard a howl further away from us, in the direction of some of the fleeing family. We turned the corner of the street to be lit up by red and blue lights. We were face to face with a cop car. The spotlight hit us and we heard the doors open on either side. Hands up, drop the guns, came a command from the driver's side. We did as he commanded, as we were both being blinded by the spotlight. We heard the clatter of Sean's guns hitting the asphalt. I saw one of the cops approaching us from the passenger side. Turn around. Don't face me, he screamed. We both did, now facing out into the darkness of the street. Oh, shit, I stated, as I saw a wolf creature in the distance, twice as big as the others. It was Alexi, his glowing eyes approaching. He was carrying something large and cylindrical in his hands. Sean ducked just in time as a manhole cover came spinning towards him like a frisbee from out of the darkness. 
I heard a sickening thud and the crashing of the police car's windshield. I spun around to see the manhole cover embedded in the windshield and blood everywhere. I looked down to see the body of the cop that was approaching us, his head smashed backwards, his mouth ripped open and gushing blood. The cop on the driver's side was pulled into the darkness from behind. Gunshots and growls followed. The time for running had stopped. I soon knew the entire pack had arrived. And Mikhail was going to take his kill. Part 3 We stood with our hands up facing the giant wolf approaching us. This one stood at least seven foot tall and was still hunched over and had to be over 300 pounds. He wore no tattered clothes. His body was completely engulfed in jet black fur with stripes of white around his eyes and ears. His left eye gold and his right eye reflecting green back at us. Behind us we could hear the growling and screaming of the cop fighting the wolf that grabbed him from behind. More gunshots rang out and I hope the poor cop was able to wound his monstrous attacker before he was killed. Sean leaned over to me and whispered, The siren's in the cop car. I was vaguely aware of what he meant. I knew the car alarm earlier hurt their eardrums, but how was I supposed to get to the car surrounded by both of them? Now, he shouted. I was really starting to get pissed off. How was I supposed to know what to do every time he yelled something and started shooting? And shooting he did. He quick drew the pistol he'd stolen and fired off a continuous stream at the big black wolf. I spun to make a mad dash to the driver's seat with his door open. I jumped into the cramped seat and looked down at all the buttons mounted in the middle panel. At first, my panic made it impossible to comprehend what any of it meant. I was shaken back into reality as Sean's body was slammed down onto the windshield next to the embedded manhole cover. The force of the impact made him crush the glass inward like a cracked shell on an egg. Finally, my brain kicked into gear and I saw a switch labelled Siren with three settings. I cranked that bad boy all the way up and the car lit up like a Christmas tree. The takedown lights came on, flooding light in all directions. The red and blue lights flashed vigorously and the siren belted out its ear-splitting tune. All that extra light exposed Alexi towering right in front of the car. I could see his gigantic frame through the smashed windshield and around Sean's limp body, his eyes burning holes down at me. He grabbed his ears with his huge paws and whimpered in pain from the sudden blare of the siren. I jerked that car into drive and was going to hit Alexi with a thousand pounds of charger, but I heard a wet thump on the window next to me. I turned to see the poor policeman who'd stopped us. He was missing half of his face, with an eyeball gone and his cheek totally ripped away to show his teeth underneath. I saw the absolute fear in his remaining eye and almost opened the door for him to come in. Almost. Something hit the cop with enough force to shatter the glass. He was launched head first into the car and across my lap lodged between me and the steering wheel. A large claw reached in after him and grabbed me by the hair. It was the wolf from earlier, the one Sean had peppered with a shotgun on the street. Well, this wolf had seen better days. It looked like the cop had shot him a couple of times before being smashed through the car window because the wolf was wheezing from multiple gunshots to the chest. I slammed on the gas and Alexei quickly stepped out of the way of the launching vehicle. I rocketed away from the wharf while he still had a hold of my hair. There was a painful rip as he yanked out a handful from my head. I screamed in pain and tried to see around the dead cop on top of me and Sean's unresponsive body embedded in the shattered windshield. I swerved and skidded away from the walls, down the deserted streets, my vehicle wailing and lighting up the city as I desperately tried to escape. I tried to push the dead cop back out the window, I had a better time pulling him most of the way in, his legs sticking awkwardly out of the window. It was a miracle Sean stayed put on the windshield, until my tires lost traction on a slick patch of road and I slid sideways into a parked car on the street at around 40 miles an hour. Like a patient being transferred from one gurney to another, 
Sean rolled sideways off my hood and onto the snow-covered hood of the parked car. This was ridiculous. I knew I had to stop and check on him, and get his dead body off of me. I turned off the lights and sirens to leave us on a suddenly quiet street. I pulled the car out enough to open the door and wrestle my way out of the driver's seat. As much as I wanted to run to Sean, I took the time to pull the dead cop out and lay him on the street. The cop's gun was missing, so I snatched his pepper spray and taser. I finally made my way over to Sean. His eyes were closed, and he looked like he was sleeping like a baby with the soft snow piled around him like cushions. The snow around his right shoulder was colored red with blood from a new bite mark. I would have taken him for dead if there wasn't the slight fog of breath coming out of his mouth. Sean! I yelled, slapping him lightly on his cold cheeks. I kept shaking him, and he only moaned. A wolf's howl pierced the air behind us, and his eyes shot open. For an instant, I thought they'd glow golden in the moonlight. He shut up with a start and grabbed me by the neck, his teeth grinding as he growled at me. Sean, stop! I gasped at him. His face didn't change as his grip tightened, and he looked at me like I was a bug he was about to squish. I'd done it. I'd pushed him too far. He was a killer, and now he was going to kill me. Maybe I deserved it. But finally, he blinked, and the cruel look of anger slid off his face, to be replaced by recognition. He let me go and looked around, frightened. We need to go, he said. I can smell them, he said groggily. What? I mumbled. Are you okay? I reached out to touch his bloody shoulder. He looked down at the bloody wound in confusion. Yeah, actually, I feel great, he said in awe. His pupils were dilated, and he smiled a little. <laughs> All Sleeping Beauty needed was a little nap. I said sarcastically, and pulled him off the car. He flopped into the passenger seat of the patrol car beside me, and I cranked the battle car up. I flipped the yellow taser in front of his face. He took it after a moment of consideration. Yes, the pepper spray stays with you, he stated with a half smile. Why was he so nonchalant? He was starting to freak me out. Oh, we need new wheels, he said in his normal, emotionless tone. Every cop in the city will be gunning for us now. They probably called out their descriptions to dispatch before they were killed. Not a good look for us. I'll park it after we put some more distance between us and the pack, I said. Suddenly the roof caved in over our heads from something heavy slamming down on it. Oh shit, I screamed in terror from the sudden commotion. I stepped on the gas so fast we did a burnout before lurching forward. Sean reached down and flipped on the siren. It wailed sharply before there was a wretched clanging and screeching of the light bar and sirens being ripped out of his mounted position. The siren let out a pitiful whimper as it was flung to clatter in front of us, causing me to swerve from the twisted debris. I knew our passenger was one of the wolves, but which one? My questions were answered as the legless body of a mutilated man was slapped against the windshield by the wolf on our roof. The man's intestines were dangling from his stomach as the wolf smeared his innards all over the windshield, obscuring my view with gore. It was one of the people I'd doused with perfume. It had to be Mikhail performing this savagery. I was still racing down the mostly empty streets, only seeing the road out of a corner of unblemished windshield. A white-furred hand reached around through the busted window towards me. The large hand wrapped around my tiny left wrist, and pulled it free from my grasp around the steering wheel, but I still held on tightly with my right hand. The great strength of the wolf began to pull me up and out of my seat. Sean, help! I screamed with panic as half of my body was already out of the window. I held on desperately with my right hand, but my grip would soon be broken. I felt Sean straighten the steering wheel. He anchored himself around my waist. Now I could see the wolf was pulling me up by my hand. It was a snowy white wolf, contrasted with bright red blood smeared all over his face and muscular chest. His eyes were also bright red dots against cloudy orbs. 
He held me up with his right arm while his left hand dug into the top of the roof, holding him steadily atop his perch. I'd never seen Mikhail as a wolf, but I knew this was the sadistic blonde-haired albino that I'd learned to hate. The cold air whipped across my face as his lips curled back in a cruel smile. I'd lost my grip on the steering wheel and was only being kept halfway in the car by Sean's futile attempt to save me. I knew I was about to die as Mikhail opened his mouth, slobber flying out in long lines, until I felt something hard and plastic being placed in my hand. With Sean holding the lower part of my body, I swung my right hand up to place the taser under Mikhail's chin. He didn't even notice it before the doors of the taser cartridge popped open and two electric barbs shot up straight into the underside of his chin. The taser made its patented sound as the monster's body seized up, his grip almost breaking my wrist. Sean must have heard the taser's rapid song and jerked me hard back down inside, cutting me up good on the broken glass. He slammed on the brakes and the car lurched as the tire screeched against the asphalt. The upper half of my body was flung forward to smack painfully against the doorframe, as Mikhail's body flew forward from the momentum to bounce and slide heavily across the icy road. At the end of his third rolling tumble, he righted himself to land deftly on all fours, skidding to turn and look at me with hatred in his red eyes. I unwedged my bruised and bloodied ribs from the door's window frame and grabbed the wheel, throwing the car into reverse. Mikhail's sleek white forms began charging back at us. The beat-up old cop car started to drive backwards. He was back on two feet now, at full sprint, inches away from being able to grab the hood of the car. I was looking out the back window and saw we were coming up to a T-junction. We'd have to turn right or left, and Mikhail would be on us in an instant. Sean pulled out his old gun and announced loudly, Turn the car for me to face him. I'll shoot him point blank. He quickly started rolling down his window. Well, I thought we were out of ammo, but maybe Sean had one shot left, so I trusted him and did what he asked. While speeding backwards, we came to the turn. I whipped the wheel to turn Sean's window facing the charging Mikhail. Sean steadied the pistol with both hands, lightly going for a precision headshot on the charging Mikhail. The two of them were face to face, Mikhail already within reaching distance, and point blank with Sean's pistol. Play dead, Fido, he yelled at Mikhail. Mikhail's red eyes widened and he quickly threw himself to the side. He slid behind the meager cover of a mailbox and traffic light on the street corner. No gunshot came, and Sean whipped his head around to scream at me. Drive! Drive! I slammed the car into drive and we rocketed forward and away from Mikhail. The rearview mirror showed a very confused white wolf getting back to his feet as he got smaller and smaller. The engine roared as we lost sight of Mikhail at the next turn. The bluff had worked. The wolves had learned Sean was proficient with firearms and prima donna Mikhail didn't want half his face missing from a well-placed shot. I heard his howl following us as we left him behind. We sat for a while in silence, letting our nerves calm down as we twisted and turned through the city streets. It was obvious we had to get a new vehicle, as I'd had to hang my head out of the window to see where we were going half the time. Once I felt we were far enough away, I backed the beat-up cop car into a dark alley. We sat for a little while in silence. Sean unwrapped the tape from around his arm and was amazed to find the bite marks had almost healed. We looked at each other worried, neither of us wanting to state the obvious, that he was changing into one of them. The quiet between us was broken by my phone ringing. I looked at the number to see it was Mikhail calling. I answered it and put it on speakerphone for Sean to hear. After moments of static silence, Mikhail's wrathful and slightly whiny voice broke through. You will die tonight, Hall. You will die by my hand. You and your little guard dog will not deny me my right. Sean and I looked at each other, 
and shared the cringe. Mikhail continued with his vitriol. You think you're a hero? Good sister? I didn't want your used up tainted flesh. I wanted your sweet sister. You think convincing Alexei's son to mate with her that you saved her from the hunt? Oh, you are wrong. I'll kill both of you tonight. Well, it was true. I had used my charms to convince the foolish boy, Alexei's wolf son Nico, that if he liked me, there was nothing in comparison to my beautiful pure sister. I convinced Nico my sister was the one he wanted. She was wifey material, or at least exclusive breeding material. I'd noticed Mikhail eyeing my sister too. He wanted her, but for a completely different reason. Mikhail didn't want my sister purity. He wanted her blood. He wanted his initiation kill to be her. I'd work fast to seduce the young pup Nico. I spoke whispers of my sister during the early hours. I said the prince deserved the best mate, and my sister was the best. It would be a pairing against her will, but Nico was kind and gentle, well, for a wolf. So you can see Mikhail's anger when he chose my sister for his hunt, and got the bargain basement model instead. <laughs> he got me. Nico had gotten his daddy's ear, and Alexei had denied the young upstart Mikhail his kill of my sister. Take me off speakerphone. Mikhail said calmly in a language only spoken between the clan. I understood the phrase and turned off the speaker and tucked the phone to my ear. I have clan members loyal to me stationed at Anika's lodging, he continued in normal speech. Turn yourself in to me, or I give the order to rip her throat out. You've had your fun, but I will kill your little sister if you don't let me kill you. I'll even make it quick if you don't make a fuss. There was a pause, and I felt my heart drop. I knew Mikhail was selfish enough to go against the clan if he wasn't getting his own way, and he did have a group of human followers that followed him around like he was a superstar. He would kill my sister, and all of this would be for nothing. The parking structure under the bridge, before you take the exit to the wicker construction site. He continued with the directions. Don't tell your guard dog. Bring him or leave him, I don't care. He's dead either way. He paused. You have one hour, he stated. Mikhail hung up the phone and we sat in silence. Fresh falling snow covered the blood cake windshield, and Sean stared at me expectantly, his breath beginning to frost. I need to tell you something, Sean, but you're not going to like it. I finally admit it. Part 4 I told Sean the truth. I couldn't lie to him anymore. He'd saved my life multiple times in only a few hours. I told him about Mikhail's demand, and how he'd probably kill Sean whether he survived the night or not. I told him about my sister, about how this was all for her. I told him how I took her place in this hunt so she could be indentured off to a safer life with Alexei's son. I told him how Mikhail lusted after my sister, but not a sexual lust, but a blood lust. And finally, I told him that Mikhail was rigging the game by threatening to kill my sister if I didn't sacrifice myself to him. So now I sat alone in a newly stolen car, with only the sound of the wind blowing through its broken window to accompany the rushing thoughts in my head. I looked in the rearview mirror to see the mess that was me. My mascara was running dark tears down my face. My face had been cut from the shattered glass, and a large chunk of my hair was missing. I was a far contrast from the seductive damsel in distress I portrayed earlier in the night. I saw the exit ramp to the wicker construction site coming up ahead. I was so close to freedom, but I couldn't go there. I had to instead save my sister and meet with Mikhail under the overpass. I'd done everything to save my little sister. It's what my mother made me promise on her deathbed. Maybe I couldn't free her from the clan, but well, I could make sure she was safe inside the clan. My mother had worked for the Nuri clan, 
the same wolves that chase me now. She was diagnosed with cancer in her early 30s. She could have asked for money from the clan to afford her treatment, but she refused. She knew that if she died, the clan would hold the debts over me and my sister. Well, my mother passed, and the arseholes took us anyway. I was 12 and Anika 10, and they began grooming us right away. I hated all of them. I took the turn around under the overpass and drove into a small parking lot shrouded in shadows from the overhead highway. My headlights illuminated the tall white figure of Mikhail in his wolf form, his white fur still painted red with blood. He held out a cell phone in his large clawed hands. I knew it was a threat showing me he could still order his men to kill Anika. I got out of the car with my head down, defeated. I slammed the car door shut harder than was necessary. You said you'd make it quick, and Anika will be safe. I said to him with disdain, At least honor something you say. Mikhail stood still like a statue before I realized he was concentrating on turning back into his human form. He couldn't talk in wolf form, so of course he'd want to gloat and monologue before he killed me. Mikhail shrunk half a foot and his wolf head returned to normal. His white fur gave way to his pale, naked skin. A familiar smirk quickly found its way across his perfect face. He stood proudly in his nudity, like the cold had no effect. White fur wilted off him in soggy clumps, the moonlight from the street reflecting off his sculpted body. He stretched his muscles by rotating his shoulder and cracking his neck and jaw. Mikhail bent down to retrieve a silver revolver from the snow by his feet. He dusted it off and checked the cylinder for ammo. Satisfied, he flicked the weapon back shut and motioned for me to step forward. Arrogance and bravado exuded off him like a thick stench. All of this was for show, to dominate me one more time before my death. I'll make it quick like I promised, he chatted cordially, spinning the gun around on his fingers. I'll have to shoot you at an angle, I think, he said, outstretching his arm to point the gun at my neck, then twisting his wrist to point the barrel upward slightly. I'll shoot you up through the neck and into the skull. Well, of course, I'll have to rip your head off in my wolf form to make it look like a proper kill. He smiled sadistically. But is my sister safe? I asked meekly, taking a small step towards my killer. He crooked an eyebrow at me. For now, he said. Once I've gained some seniority in the clan, I'll talk with Nico about making a trade with me for one of my harem girls. Nico may be royalty, but he's weak-willed and easily persuaded. Now, come, he snapped. Kneel before me. I walked up within arm's distance of him, but refused to kneel. He looked about and smiled wider. As you wish, whore. Die on your feet like you aren't used to being on your knees. Mikhail was thoroughly enjoying himself as he looked around the deserted underpass. Where's your guard dog? He didn't tag along? Mikhail mentioned as he scanned the darkness and inside of the stolen car. Oh, you cut him loose, Mikhail finally stated. Oh, that is some actual character development for you. I thought you hated all men. No matter. He's been marked for death anyways. He can't be left alive after being bit on the full moon. We can't have strays running around now, can we? Well, I hadn't noticed the moon. I guess it would have to be a full moon on the night of the sacred hunt. I barely noticed the sky during all the violence and commotion. Sean had been bitten and infected on this supernatural night. The clan would not let him survive for long as a newly turned wolf. Mikhail pointed his pistol, and I scrambled to buy more time. I don't hate all men. Just chauvinist assholes like you. You want to know why? I teased with a sarcastic smile. I saw a litany of emotions cross his arrogant face. At first it was anger. I thought he'd pull the trigger on impulse. The second was hurt and general amazement. How could a woman dislike such a specimen as he... And so his face resigned to smug curiosity, and he stilled his hand. Oh, why, dear whore, he snickered, 
trying to hide his genuine interest. I was about to emotionally unload on him. I was going to tell him everything I hated about his sadistic face and his sadistic clan, and how they'd systematically ruin my life. I felt the tears begin to flow as I began to open my mouth. Mikhail, what the hell do you think you're doing? Came a voice in the wolf's native language. We both turned to see an older man jogging up, obviously limping and favouring his chest. It was the wolf that Sean had wounded lightly in the beginning, and the cop had shut multiple times before the wolf threw the cop through the windshield. The wolf was haggard and grey. Obviously he was the oldest of the pack, but his muscles were corded and rippling through his flesh. His face was the only thing human. None of your business, old man. I'm ending the hunt. Just had the gun out in case her Rambo bodyguard decided to show up. Mikhail shouted disrespectfully at his elder. Well, the elder stiffened, not taking the upstart's bullshit. He sniffed the air lightly and looked around, like he didn't feel the animosity coming from Mikhail. What are you doing here anyways? Meet up at the construction site and we'll end the ceremony there, Mikhail demanded. The elder huffed and used his pointer human fingers to wipe his eyes as he continued in their guttural tongue. Ah, I was looking out for you, Pop. This is your night, isn't it? That smelled wolf blood. Well, my sensitive hearing hasn't gone yet either. So now I know you're playing your own games to cheat and win. I'll have to tell Alexei of your blatant disregard for our sacred rule. I saw Mikhail flinch as the elder continued. I meanwhile snuck back to the cover of the open driver's seat of the car. Furthermore, pup, the wounded elder tried to continue through wheezing breaths, but was interrupted with multiple shots from Mikhail's pistol slamming into his exposed human face, neck, and injured wolf body. The elder clouched in the snow like a bloody snow angel, steam and heat rising from his dying body. Don't lecture me, you old bastard, Mikhail yelled at the dead elder. Shit, now I'm out of ammo, said Mikhail, at the sight of his empty pistol. I guess I can blame it on your toy boy you had shooting at everyone, as he threw his empty gun on the ground. Mikhail looked up at the full moon peeking lowly over the buildings with intense concentration. Finally, he spoke with a jovial voice. Oh, if I can make a Mr. Brightside reference, I'll be coming out of this cage doing just fine, right? He smiled his gorgeous smile. Ah, the elder was a massive, dickless blowhard, and I get to kill you as slow as I always wanted now. I was too busy scrambling around inside my rusted white Buick to really notice all the dumb stuff Mikhail was saying, but I could hear the naked Mikhail slowly begin to tread towards the vehicle. Mikhail was stopped by a hissing laughter coming from the dying elder in his makeshift snow grave. Mikhail stopped and turned to look at his betrayed clansman. <sighs> Foolish young pup. <laughs> Quietly, the elder wheezed in common tongue. I smelt the blood of a wolf. You don't even use your own powerful senses, greatly. What are you talking about, you mangy mutt? Just die already, will you? Mikhail barked. During Mikhail's tirade, the trunk of the Buick popped open and a lithe figure stepped out to the passenger's side door and aimed an awkwardly bright yellow weapon at him. Ah, there are two of me, you dumbass. You didn't smell the one in the trunk? The elder croaked with his dying breath. Mikhail turned to see Sean posted up against the passenger's side of the Buick, aiming what looked like a bright yellow shotgun at Mikhail. A beanbag round flew at sonic speed to rocket towards Mikhail's proudest target. The bag pelted him right in his exposed and unprotected genitals. The albino man let out a gasping whimper and collapsed into a fetal position. Sean racked loose the spent shell and loaded another non-lethal beanbag round into the yellow shotgun. Well, I just wish cops had real guns, not this hugger-thug bullshit. Sean yelled in righteous anger as he pointed the barrel down at the whimpering Mikhail's face. Another beanbag rocked Mikhail's face into a bloody mess, 
sending him spiraling into unconsciousness. Sean's anger wasn't satisfied as he flipped the shotgun over to beat Michal's limp body with. That won't work, Sean, I cried. When they're close to death, they heal crazy quick. Beating him will make him even stronger. Sean paused mid-pummel, Mikhail already convulsing violently. What about the old-timer? Is he dead? It must have been silver bullets in Mikhail's gun. Oh, he was always paranoid of the wolves around him. That or Mikhail landed a killing shot on the weakened elder wolf, I explained quickly. I got in the car and honked. Sean stared down at Mikhail's mangled face in pure anger, his eyes glinting. I honked louder to snap him out of his rage. Ah, less than lethal bullshit. Why can't cops carry real weapons anymore? He growled as he tossed the yellow shotgun into the darkness. He gritted his teeth, and I thought he wouldn't turn to listen to me. Look, it's almost over, Sean, I pleaded. Grab his phone and come on. It has all the evidence we need to save both of us. He had it rigged against us from the beginning, and the dead wolf has silver bullets on him. Dick one of those out for if we see Alexi. Sean grumbled and kicked around in the snow before coming to his senses and swiping up Mikhail's old flip phone. He then unceremoniously walked over to the dead elder wolf and jammed his hand into a gunshot wound in his neck to retrieve a clump of silver and blood. Mikhail was starting to moan, and his smashed face was returning to its perfect countenance again. Sean finally relented and slid into the passenger seat beside me. The full moon's healing both of you quickly, I gasped. We need to get to the safe house and end this. As I put the car into reverse, I could already see Mikhail sit up and blink the grogginess out of his eyes. Sean let out a low growl at him. We drove for the next five minutes around the wicker construction site's fence. Hastily spray-painted wooden signs pointed us to the correct entrance. We finally arrived at a set of turnstiles surrounded by a high fence with razor wire stretched across the top. We turned off the car and cautiously made our way to the spinning metal bars. Hopefully it would allow both of us to enter through the revolving bars, but Sean let me go first. We thankfully made it through the turnstiles to enter a large, sparse concrete lot, littered with lamps, construction equipment, and boxy metal buildings. One of the building's front doors was open with an inviting yellow glow from inside. So that's the finish line? Sean stared, more as a statement. It's obviously a trap. Yep, I said as we trudged towards the welcoming light. A massive figure stepped up to the doorframe, cutting off the warm light. It was Alexi in full wolf form with his two-toned eyes of gold and green and black fur with white around his eyes. He was having to duck in the trailer, and he stepped out onto the stairs and turned his body to motion with his hands for us to pass into the room. What the hell is this? I said suspiciously. Nothing, Alexi said through his deep wolf voice. Years of experience had taught him to speak while in wolf form. You cheated. But you knew you had to defeat Mikhail. It was his test, and he failed. I walked past Alexei into the office. It was warm and well lit, with bottles of water and sandwiches on a side table. Sean went to follow, and Alexei stepped in his way, poking a sharpened bone claw into his chest. Not you, boy. You killed an honored pack member and injured many more. You've taken a bite from me and have already begun the change. The ancient rules declare your death. I watched Sean take a step back and raise his fists in a pitiful attempt to challenge the gigantic Alexi. Sean began sniffing the air, and a look of horror washed over his face. Sean backed further out into the snowy yard and Alexi followed. Sean's head whipped back and forth, searching the darkness around him. I stepped forward to the door's edge to see what Sean was looking at. There were multiple sets of glowing eyes flanking him out of the darkness, at least ten sets of eyes in total, towering over him and drawing closer and closer in a tightening circle. At this point, the ten lumbering wolves entered the light spilling out the doorway, towering above him, standing upright. 
many I hadn't seen before, some I had. Sean sighed a deep sigh of defeat and dropped his guard, his shoulders slumped. Stand the mutt up for me to see him, Alexei barked out into the crowd. Alexei made a quick motion with his head, and two unknown wolves shot out to grab Sean by either shoulder. Sean pulled back with a growl, and his eyes flashed gold for a moment, but he quickly realized he was not getting away. The two wolves held Sean tightly as Alexei walked down the short steps towards him, to lift up his chin in his clawed hand to look down directly into Sean's gold eyes. You have two options. The guttural mix of beast and man issued from Alexei's throat. You interfered with our sacred hunt and resulted in the deaths of two of my clan. Sean's face was stoic, but the cold was making him shiver. Our ancient rules dictate death to the outsider, but I am a reasonable packmaster, and I know the trickier wiles of the female. He growled at Sean. Once more, I have fought you, and you showed no regard for yourself above her. You drew on me and fired in an instant so she could escape. That may be the reason I went for the shoulder instead of the neck. Honor is a rare trait among humans. So, you spared me, Sean said quietly, looking down from the intimidating aura of Alexei. Do I join your little werewolf? Alexei moved in a flash and snatched up Sean by his throat, lifting him up two feet to be face level with Alexei. Like you and the girl found out, Mikhail was an honorless cheater and coward. I may have suspected, but I guess the female knew from the beginning, so she felt she needed to cheat herself. Alexei looked back at me with contempt. He then sat the blue-faced Sean back down and continued. You kill Mikhail and join as a new pup in the clan, or you refuse and you die right here. After coughing a bit, Sean straightened to look Alexei square in the eyes now. So I'm meant to hunt an experienced wolf who can transform. Last I saw him, he was healing from a broken face under an underpants. There was a series of barks behind Sean, causing him to turn, and I saw the last thing I expected to see. Two fully morphed wolves were dragging a naked Mikhail in human form. They pushed him forward towards Sean and Alexei. So, I heard the deal, Packmaster. I'm to let this pleb kill me, Mikhail said opulently, still not ashamed of his nudity. No, Mikhail, Alexei growled over Sean's shoulder. If you kill this mutt, we give you 24 hours to leave the country. You'll be exiled from the clan. The network system of human followers you've accumulated are being hunted down as we speak. Alexei shrugged. <sighs> Maybe another weaker clan will take you on eventually, if you can kill this human right now. Three things happened at once. Mikhail smiled sadistically. Sean took up a fighting stance with a look of horror, and I screamed. That's not fair. It's slaughter. A wolf to a lamb. I was particularly proud of that last allegory, and Alexei turned again to consider me. I didn't mention the rules, he barked. In order to join the New Eri clan, you must have cunning as much as brute force. He turned to Mikhail and said coldly, You fight this man in human form, or I'll have you ripped apart by your former clansmen. The smug look on Mikhail's face faltered, and he looked around at the seriously imposing wolves forming a circle around him, Sean, and Alexei. Alexei walked backwards to join the circle. Begin, he growled. Mikhail was the first to strike, with a one-two slash with his arms. The first one caught Sean's right eye and cheek with a bloody scratch, and Sean blocked the other strike by raising his elbow. Mikhail winced at having his soft human hand collide with Sean's hard elbow, and he stepped back while trying to shake the pain out of his injured wrist. Sean touched the bloody scratches on his cheek and smiled. I think he realized what I realized at the same time. Mikhail was a weakling in human form. I would like to say Mikhail put up a valiant effort, 
but I'm not going to lie for that shit. Sean got within his reach and beat his naked ass all through the snow with throat punches and elbows and eye gouges. I'd seen how efficient Sean was at ending fights, so I knew he was taking his time with Mikhail. Finally, Sean delivered a low kick to the inside of Mikhail's knee, causing him to crumple to his other knee in the snow. Mikhail tried to stand, but Sean performed a devastating downwards elbow, like an axe, to the top of Mikhail's head. Mikhail staggered and almost toppled over in the snow. If Sean hadn't swooped in behind him and wrapped him up in a chokehold, he would have done. Sean arched backwards, lifting Mikhail's bare toes out of the snow. Mikhail kicked and wheezed groggily. This was it. Sean was going to strangle Mikhail to death in the next couple of seconds. Well, true to Mikhail's nature, or just survival instincts, his body exploded in mass, his rapidly expanding back and neck muscles flinging Sean off of him. The white fur sprouted instantly to cover him, and his already albino eyes glowed red. Wolf Mikhail turned around to face Sean laying on his back in the snow. His bone claws grew to around ten inches in length, and drool ran from his mouth like a frothy waterfall. Mikhail was about to pounce on Sean for the kill, before the enormous black mass of Alexei stepped up between them. Mikhail looked at Alexei in surprise, which quickly turned to anger. Mikhail swiped his long right claw at Alexei, only for it to be caught by Alexei's black, furred, muscled hand. There was a wicked snap as Alexei broke Mikhail's wrist with just his grasp. Mikhail attempted to let out a howl of pain, before Alexei seized the bottom part of Mikhail's jaw and ripped downwards, sickly ripping Mikhail's bottom jaw and most of his throat out in a gory mess. To finish it off, Alexei used both hands to grab Mikhail and snap his neck with a vicious twist. Mikhail finally fell dead to the ground, while Sean had been playing with him earlier. Alexei was obviously done playing. After the shock wore off and the warm blood poured around the dead Mikhail, the wolves eagerly helped Sean to his feet. I heard a door open behind me in the office and was hit with cold air and a scent of cologne. It was Nico's cologne. I turned my head to face him. He was handsome and rugged like his father, but with kind eyes and dimples from constant smiles. He was dressed immaculately in a fitted suit. He stared at me forlornly for a while. I could almost see a tear forming in his eye. Don't, Nico, I commanded gently. Don't show weakness to them. I was never going to survive the night after all the havoc I'd caused. I only wanted Anika to survive. I said, tears now in my eyes. Nika walked up close behind me now. She'll be fine. She'll be safe, father says. There's only one catch. He trailed off. You must kill me, I answered him. The two of us started all this. We must end it. I felt him nod in agreement behind me. Outside, the ten wolves held Sean upright. I'd seen the ceremony before. All the wolves would bite a new recruit on a full moon to seal his initiation into the pack. The wolves gathered around Sean and outstretched his arms for a good place to bite him. I could feel Nico's bone claw tickling my neck. Sean and I looked at each other in terror. But in an instant, it disappeared from both our faces he and I were determined. Take care of Anika, I said. I will, Nico whispered back as he slit my throat with his claw, blood flowing freely over my red scarf. As my vision faded, I saw Sean nod to me. Sean knew I was talking to him, not Nico. Sean wasn't a wolf, he was a protector and if he'd found me worthy of protecting, for sure he would my little sister. Then all the wolves bit Sean at once, and my vision faded to black as Nico cradled me.
So, my dear friends, yes, that is um, uh, one of my older stories from about three and a half years ago. And as happens sometimes, I've had a, somebody claim um, the music that I use in the background, which, as you also might know, is pretty annoying for me because I actually recorded, composed the background music myself to all my videos. So when somebody claims it and they just won't let go, I just say, right, do it again, start from scratch. So um, that is an older one. Uh, new Newer listeners may not have heard it, and it's a good one, so... Why not uh, repackage it? <laughs> so yeah, that is from Caleb Slieger, the author of Reverse Vampires, which will be returning again very soon with a, another hour's worth of the story. A lot of you asking if that's going to continue. The answer is yes. So my dear friends, that is it for your Monday Evenings Entertainment. Back again very soon. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams. and Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.